speaker, Dr. Nanette Wenger. Time will not permit me to go through her extensive bio and contribution to the world of cardiovascular medicine. But briefly, Dr. Nanette Wenger is an emeritus professor of medicine at the Division of Cardiology at Emory University School of Medicine. And I'm proud to call her my senior colleague, mentor, and sponsor. In a career that really spans more than 60 years, her steadfast dedication to reducing disparities in cardiovascular disease, especially among women, is something not to be glossed over. And not to take time away from her great presentation, I will turn it over to Dr. Nanette Wenger. Welcome, Dr. Wenger. Dr. Wenger, I believe you're on mute. Okay, I'm trying to get my slides up. Can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Yes. They're not in presenter mode, but we can see them. Okay. Now we're good. It's all yours. Okay. It it, 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 it took a skilled assistant to help me. First, I want to thank you for the invitation and say how delighted I am to be working uh, with colleagues of a number of years, uh, both Dr. Ogunyi and Dr. Wright, uh, and on the very important topic of hypertension. And what I want to do for the next several minutes is to address with you hypertension in women across the lifespan. Uh, these are my disclosures and they do not interfere with the presentation. And what I want us to do is to understand the adverse pathophysiologic consequences of hypertension in women, but particularly to appreciate the unique aspects of hypertension that women have across their lifespan. The background, as well you know, is that hypertension accounts for one in five deaths for women. And actually the hypertension burden is greater for women than for men. And the reason is that hypertension in women compared with our male peers has more adverse pathophysiologic consequences. There is more development of left ventricular hypertrophy, of diastolic dysfunction, of heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction, of development of increased arterial stiffness, of association with diabetes mellitus, and of the development of chronic kidney disease. But there are different concomitant cardiovascular issues across the lifespan that we must appreciate. Let's go through definitions first. We went through hypertension. Now hypertensive heart disease. Hypertensive heart disease is a structural and functional cardiac changes that are caused by uncontrolled hypertension. And if we can control hypertension, we can limit, delay, or possibly even avert the development of hypertensive heart disease. Hypertensive heart disease, more prevalent in women than men, and actually, it's less modifiable, even with hypertensive therapy. It offsets the lower cardiovascular risk that non-hypertensive women have compared with their male counterparts. And the important modulators are obesity, arterial stiffness, and inflammation. Let's start looking at the youngest among us the hypertension in teenage and young adult women. Hypertension prevalence in children and adolescents is low, but not inconsequential, it's one to 5%. But once we get into the preteen years, the prevalence at age 10 to 17 is 15.7%. And those who appear to be at greater risk 
are those who have obesity and a family history of hypertension. So once you get a family involved in the management of hypertension, you can affect all family members. Now, this is the emphasis. Secondary hypertension, meaning potentially reversible, is more predominant in children and young adults than it is at older age. So when you see a young adult with hypertension, look first for the secondary causes, renal artery uh, fibromuscular dysplasia, and more than 90% of those occur in women. Hyperaldosteronism, hypothyroidism, combined hormonal contraceptives, virtually all the illicit drugs, a number of diet and herbal products, theochromocytoma, and as I tell my trainees, the thou shalt not miss aortic coarctation. Now, again, in teenage and young adult women, what we see is that it's not uniform across the spectrum of women because non-Hispanic African-American women are far more likely to have hypertension when they present to us with pregnancy. And, you know, we talk about the social determinants of health, so important with hypertension. And what we see in this age group, the socioeconomic factors, is that without access to health care or insurance or below the poverty level, teenage and young adult women are less likely to take their medications as prescribed. And what they tend to do is reduce, reduce the financial burden by taking fewer or no medications. So this becomes a very important consideration in the care of teenage and young adult women. I'm going to spend perhaps an undue percentage of my time on hypertension and pregnancy because this is one of the major causes of maternal morbidity and mortality. Hypertension is the most prevalent cardiovascular disorder in pregnancy, and it occurs in 5 to 10% of U.S. pregnancies. Now, it's important to realize the classification and the uh, ACOG uh, classifies hypertension in pregnancy in four different ways. Chronic hypertension is a blood pressure more than 140 over 90 that was present before the pregnancy or before week 20. And week 20 becomes a dividing point. Preeclampsia, which may be superimposed on chronic hypertension, is hypertension with or without proteinuria or with a very severe presentation, that's thrombocytopenia, renal insufficiency, impaired liver function, pulmonary edema. These are the critically ill women. Eclampsia is when preeclampsia occurs with a new seizure. Now, gestational hypertension, very different, is the appearance of hypertension after 20 weeks into the pregnancy. That's how you differentiate the gestational from the chronic hypertension. Now, chronic hypertension in 1% to 5% of pregnancies, gestational hypertension in 6 to 7% of pregnancies, not inconsequential, and preeclampsia and eclampsia in up to 10%. One in 10 pregnant women may have preeclampsia or eclampsia. And the reason for the worry is that preeclampsia has increased by 25% in the last two decades. Not really sure exactly why, but my thought is that more women are coming to a pregnancy with cardiovascular risk factors. It's obviously among the major causes of maternal and perinatal morbidity and mortality, but it is not an equal opportunity issue. It disproportionately affects African Americans, and it's more prevalent at the extremes of reproductive age, the teenage pregnancies, the older age women who are pregnant. Far more prevalent when there are underlying cardiovascular risk factors. And now the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force has entered the recommendation and recommended that screening for preeclampsia by blood pressure measurement is recommended at every pregnancy visit. And therefore, we have to tell women they should anticipate or ask that their blood pressure be checked at every pregnancy visit by their healthcare provider. Now, treatment of hypertension in pregnancy. And if anyone is copying the slides, 
remember that what I'm going to tell you here has been changed by something I'll present in a few minutes, but I want to give you the old story first. First is that now we say that if there is a high risk of preeclampsia, and the OBGYNs know this, that they recommend daily low-dose aspirin to prevent preeclampsia in high-risk women. So that is a new therapy, again, recommended by the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. But the interesting feature is we have so little data about pregnancy that there isn't a single evidence-based recommendation for tapering blood pressure medicines during pregnancy. And the specified goals of treatment are all over the place. ACOG recommends maintaining the systolic pressure 120 to 160 and diastolic 80 to 105. That's a huge range. They recommend treating severe hypertension. That's a systolic over 160 and a diastolic over 110 to reduce the risk of pulmonary edema, stroke, and placental abruption. But that is a ridiculously high level. And until very recently, the conservative approach to treat mild to moderate hypertension was to watch it, worrying that aggressive blood pressure lowering may compromise the fetal circulation. That is changing. There was one randomized trial that I've cited below on the references comparing tight, and that's a diastolic blood pressure of 85 versus a less tight, a diastolic of 100 control. Small study found no difference in maternal and fetal outcomes, so no risk. But interestingly, the less tight had more severe maternal hypertension. But I'm going to come back now to some new data in just a moment. Treatment of hypertension in pregnancy. Every one of the antihypertensive drugs crosses the placenta, so the baby might be affected. And remember that Previous to 2018, the FDA had category A, B, C, and D. Those categories have all been removed. So if you want to look at a drug during pregnancy, you have to look up a specific drug. There are no randomized trials about efficacy or safety. Previously, none of the drugs were considered safe. That was category A. The ones that seem to have some good results without risk well, hydrochlorothiazide, clothalidone, and methyl dopa. And then after that, nifedipine, labetalol, and hydralazine. There was one tra- randomized trial comparing labetalol with nifedipine, and both seemed to control the blood pressure to target. So no reason to recommend one over the other. But interestingly, American College of OBGYN recommends against a low-sodium diet during pregnancy because of the worry about low intravascular volume. So all of our standard measures for hypertension, I think were almost eradicated by the pregnancy. And I think that that may not have been the wisest thing to do. Mainly because there are long-term implications of hypertension in pregnancy. Hypertension in pregnancy increases the risk of future cardiovascular disease, diabetes and chronic kidney disease. And then the one question that we've not yet answered, is preeclampsia an independent risk factor for the development of cardiovascular disease, or is it simply a marker of pre-existing cardiovascular risk? And my take on it is that the latter is the case. Now, you know, we're all taught in school that the problem of preeclampsia disappears with the delivery of the placenta. Once the baby is born, no problem. And that is totally incorrect because the endothelial dysfunction that you see with preeclampsia persists postpartum and that endothelial dysfunction is associated with an increase in coronary calcium. And coronary calcium means coronary atherosclerosis. So that is definite disease. But amazingly, we still don't have specific recommendations of the long-term surveillance on women who've had preeclampsia. And here at Emory, in our Women's Heart Center, we have a cardiologist meeting the postpartum preeclampsia clinic to introduce themselves to the women and to see 
what we can do about the cardiovascular risk factors. We meet the women where they are. Now, this is the study that I think is very exciting. New data presented at the late-breaking trials of the American College of Cardiology this past spring, and it's the Chronic Hypertension in Pregnancy Study, the CHAP study. And what they did was to get pregnant women with mild chronic hypertension randomized to a blood pressure control of 140 over 90 as compared with the 160 over 105, which is the one I showed you on the prior slide. And this was an impressive study. Almost 2,500 women, mean age 32 years, 40% of whom were Black. So this is the population at risk. And what they showed is that antihypertensive therapy treating to a lower blood pressure improved the pregnancy outcome. The major drugs used were levetalol or extended release nifedipine. And the primary outcomes were preeclampsia, preterm delivery, percentile abruption, or fetal neonatal death. 30.2% in the treatment group, 37% in the control group, a p-value of 0.001. So definite benefit and no increased risk of low birth weight babies. So great safety. And this to me is going to change the management of hypertension and pregnancy. It certainly changes the way I treat patients. And I expect we're going to see new recommendations within the next several months. Now let's move up against through the life spectrum and look about menopause and hypertension. And the fact of the matter is that the role of sex hormones is uncertain. We know that pre-menopause, women have lower blood pressure than do the age-matched men. But postmenopausally, the women have higher blood pressure and higher pulse pressure than age-matched men. And we're not sure, is this menopause? Is this age? Is this BMI? Because all things occur simultaneously. And there are a number of factors that influence hypertension during menopause. There's some genetic predisposition because it runs in families, but hypertension is a multi-genetic disorder. There is aging, there is obesity, and obesity is a concomitant of menopause. It shouldn't be, but it is. Arterial stiffness due to atherosclerosis, oxidative stress, sex hormones. There's an age-related impairment of endothelial function, and we'll come back to that in a moment. But there seems to be an increase in salt sensitivity uh, during the menopause transition and thereafter. And what we see is the incidence of hypertension increases more precipitously in women than in men after middle age. Is this menopause or is this consequence of aging? Fact of the matter is that most women in this country will develop hypertension in their lifetime. And the question seems to be partially resolved that the menopause-related hypertension seems to be more related to an increase in BMI and in aging than to the ovarian failure to secrete estrogen. And importantly, menopausal hormone therapy of any kind does not significantly lower blood pressure and sometimes may even raise it. Now, what about elderly women? And this is the population that I truly worry about as much as I do about the very uh, pregnant women. Hypertension prevalence increases markedly with aging. And in the office, after age 80, more than 90% of the women Nine out of the 10 women I see will have hypertension. And of course, the women are the predominant group of the elderly population. Hypertension has the highest population attributable risk for dementia. And importantly, a pre-hypertensive blood pressure at age 50 predicts decreased cognition a decade earlier. Now, when I tell this to my middle-aged women, that is an impetus for blood pressure control, that this has a cognitive effect in later life. The problem is that the blood pressure control rates seem to decrease in women with aging. Perhaps we're not titrating the blood pressure medicines enough. 
because in, based on uh, in the uh, Women's Health Initiative, there was a 41% good control at age 50 to 59, compared with 29% in the 70s. Now, what we see physiologically is that endothelial dysfunction occurs later in women than in men. But you see it then in the elderly population and impaired endothelium mediated vasodilation in the elderly. We see it especially during exercise, physical activity, where there may be an exaggerated increase in blood pressure. So measuring just resting blood pressure may not be enough. But again, neither a blood pressure threshold for initiating drug therapy nor a blood pressure goal is firmly established for elderly patients because most patients were not enrolled in clinical trials. And you know, when you exclude elderly patients from clinical trials, you doubly disadvantage women. The women are less enrolled, more women are elderly, the elderly are less enrolled. And actually, there is no pharmacologic therapy comparing one with the other that's most beneficial for older women, except possibly the thiazide diuretics, because thiazide diuretics decrease calcium excretion and may help prevent osteoporosis. But I think what we must realize is that there are subgroups of elderly women where hypertensive treatment may not be beneficial those who are frail, those who have chronic kidney disease. And what we must do is to measure blood pressure in the office, both in the seated and in the standing position, because you don't want to have good blood pressure control seated, and then the patient become hypotensive with standing and have a broken hip. Let me summarize, because I've presented you a panoply uh, of hypertension over the years in women. Hypertension affects women in all phases of the life cycle and is a very important contributor to morbidity and mortality. With incident hypertension, women are more likely to develop chronic kidney disease and less likely to develop other cardiovascular outcomes in men, less likely to have a heart attack, but women less likely to have heart attacks in men than generally. But the important thing is women have a greater prevalence of concomitant risk factors that require treatment. So when you see the hypertensive woman, she often has diabetes, hyperlipidemia, obesity, sleep apnea, et cetera. And therefore the complex treatment may be a challenge both for clinicians and their patients. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Winger. Um, I hope you were able to stay on for a few minutes and to see yes, if there's of course. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to open it up to the group. If anybody has any questions, feel free to come off mute or type in the chat box. Um, and we will, Dr. Winger, oh, you're getting a ton of praise. Um, Dr. So Winger, I will kick this off. Thank you for an excellent presentation and trying and really beautifully narrowing the focus for hypertension across the lifespan in women. So I will ask you as an expert who has devoted her life to achieving health equity for women, what should be the focus has the, of the round table as we move forward? Our focus this year is to ask for equity. But what are the two or three things you think we should focus on as a group to achieve equitable outcomes for hypertension control in women across the lifespan? Again, to realize that hypertension does occur in young women and that the young women are those who are commonly going to have the hypertension of pregnancy and to educate young women that they re need to be healthy coming to a pregnancy so that their pregnancy will have a favorable outcome. So we need to control all the cardiovascular risk factors, but hypertension among, among the most common. We now have new information that tells us we need to control blood pressure better during pregnancy. And then I want to jump to the other end of the spectrum. And that is we have to tell women that Elevation of blood pressure is not 
a sign of normal aging, that we must control the blood pressure. But again, teaching both patients and their clinicians that we must, in the older adult, measure the blood pressure both sitting and standing because the response to a drop in blood pressure withstanding is much more gradual in older patients and we don't want to substitute syncope for blood pressure control. So precision and measurement, precision and control. And then Modelli, let's go back to the social determinants of health. Patients who can't normally exercise because they're not in a safe environment, who don't have access to healthy foods, who don't have insurance to enable them to take the medications that are prescribed, who live in areas where there is pollution, who can't do the recommended lifestyle changes. Social determinants of health are an enormously important part of blood pressure control. Women take care of their families. So healthy women means healthy families, means healthy community, means a healthy nation. Thank you, Dr. Wenger. That uh, Your presentation is so amazing and your lifelong devotion to women's health around hypertension control um, is amazing. So thank you so much. And the social determinants of health, I think is so critical um, because you bring up such a great point in that you know we're telling individuals to exercise or do these things, the environments that they live in may not be conducive to that advice. So I think it's a real good reminder to all of us to really be thoughtful in how we address hypertension control within our communities and in the, in the patients and clients and et cetera, everybody we're trying to impact. Um, I do have another question in the chat box and um, Allison Smith wanted to know, um, can you speak about the long-term impact on children of women who experience hypertension during pregnancy? Well, again, there are limited data, but the limited data suggests that the women who have preeclampsia, there are less data just for the hypertension, but the women who have a preeclamptic pregnancy, their children are likely to have more cardiovascular risk factors. Now, is it the preeclampsia that does it? I think that preeclampsia is just an unmasking of cardiovascular risk factors, and it's the cardiovascular risk factors that are transmitted. And remember that so many of the cardiovascular risk factors are lifestyle dependent, so that the lifestyle of the parents obviously determines the lifestyle of the children. And we have to go back to what used to be life simple seven and is now life's uh, established eight because we put sleep into that mix and realize that lifestyle is a very, very important part of health and cardiovascular health. Yes, thank you. Another question for you is, what would you think of teaching pregnant women self-monitoring blood pressure and to be family coaches? Well, again, I think self-monitoring of blood pressure is really important. Blood pressure cuffs now are quite inexpensive. Everyone can learn to use them. And having the device and putting the patient in control gives the patient responsibility and autonomy. And the patient will know, having missed medication, that that blood pressure rises. And I think just as now everyone has a thermometer in the home, everyone should probably have a blood pressure cuff in the home. And very important that the OBGYNs cooperate with us. There is a statement uh, from the American Heart Association addressing the partnership between cardiologists and OBGYNs. Mm -hmm. You know, OBGYNs are in the preventive mode. They do pap smears, uh, they do mammograms, but they're not doing the cardiovascular prevention. And Cardiovascular disease is the major cause of morbidity and mortality. So the OBGYN should really be looking at cardiovascular risk factors. Certainly they, they can refer out for management, but they should be addressing cardiovascular risk. Absolutely. And I'm making a note to ensure that we have representation from potentially ACOG here. Well, um, I, I think definitely you probably should have an OBGYN on your committees 
because this will give you access to this tremendous at-risk population. That's right. Another question came through, how do you think we can increase aspirin use during pregnancy? Well, that is now a quality measure. That is a quality measure. And I think we're beginning to see this. But remember, this is a new recommendation just for the last couple of years. And there is slow uptake of that information. But once we get the OBGYNs on board, that will happen. Incidentally, this CHAP study was led by the OBGYN community, which is why I think that the adoption of the lower blood pressure threshold is going to be very common. When I looked at the list of the uh, authors, I think there were only one or two cardiologists among them. This was an OBGYN study. It was very well done. It, it's one that we should all be applauding. Great. And um, Janet, Dr. Wright said, how can we facilitate the connections between OB and primary care in cardiology teams? Well, I think that some of it has to do with the medical record. And as you know, the electronic medical record unfortunately lives in silos. So that often when we see patients uh, in primary care, internal medicine or cardiology, the only information that's available is the number of pregnancies and the number of live births. And that loses all of the pregnancy information. And I tell my patients, and anyone that I see that they need to bring their OB history to their primary care provider. But what we have to do is to mandate that the electronic medical record uh, incorporate all of these data. You know, we're having now new mandatory changes to the electronic medical record. I don't know how many of you are aware that the Joint Commission now requires in terms of hospital accreditation, it's just hospital, not doctor's office, that the social determinants of health be in the electronic medical record. Maybe we can get the Joint Commission to see what they can do about putting the OB and the medical records together. I'm, I'm writing this down, thank you. And Dr. Wright's giving you a thumbs up, Janet's giving you a thumbs up. <laughs> Well, Dr. Wright and I have been colleagues for longer than either of us care to know, and uh, I am so delighted to see her in this position at CDC. Um, I think I think we have one last question, and then we'll um, uh, invite our panelists up. And we took your advice, Dr. Wenger, and we have an amazing panelist um, of experts and a patient advocate um, who will be speaking about real life experiences. But one more question, if that's okay. Um, of course. We have uh, uh, leveraging a model similar to the barbership, barbershop model, which we will hear about tomorrow on another panel. Is there a means to utilize a hair salon model for women in their childbearing years, including screening and lifestyle education and optimizing their disease risks before each pregnancy? Well, I, I've said if we put the same model of the barbershop into the nail salons, we would certainly get the young women and the hairdressers will get probably the older women. But we we need to come to women where they are. And that is really important. I don't know whether, and somebody can tell me, somebody can educate me, whether there are any professional associations for the nail salons but I would love to see us work with those people because they have so much conversation with their clients. And if the conversation includes heart healthy, it's going to be very important. One last question, I promise. Um, how can we use group therapy, i.e. mom groups to facilitate adoption uh, of healthy lifestyle changes and accountability? Oh my heavens, that, <laughs> the, 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 the answer is it takes a village and we have to start doing it in the schools. What the children learn in school, they'll bring home. And when physical activity doesn't happen in the school, it is viewed as unimportant. When it happens in school, then it may be translated to home. Healthy diets in the school, 
You know, decades ago, there was an American Heart Association program called Heart Health Education in the Young. And we had programs in the school. The children got stethoscopes and blood pressure cuffs. They learned to measure blood pressure. They took the cuffs home and measured it in their families. I think we need to go back to the, you know, it's, it's back to the future. We need to go back and get some of those programs again. We need to have children's games where they're building healthy diets with colors and with, with food pyramids. Uh, the anti-smoking programs have to come back again because smoking is coming back again. But we have to emphasize lifestyle. And now we have to begin with the new emphasis on sleep that has come in as number eight. Thank you so much, Dr. Winger. I'm sure everyone's virtually applauding you right now um, across the country, but we are so honored that you were able to join us today. If you can stay on, that would be fantastic for the panel. I will stay on, definitely. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. Um, 